Uh, last week, I shared with you a few new words. Uh, I, heard, I shared this in Sunday school. Um, but there are, I added a word uh, that I didn't have on the screen last week, and that is the word orthopathy. Uh, right belief, right practice, right experience. Interestingly, those three theological words that all start with ortho um, really relate to three Greek words, original words, logos, ethos, and pathos. And how fascinating that the Lord Jesus addressed that he is every one of those. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We have life because of him. We have forgiveness because of him. And this morning I want to draw, draw our attention back to that little letter of Philemon we began looking at last week. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. I'm only going to deal with four verses today. So you would normally think we're going to get out of here early. Wrong thinking. Um, we began looking at this little letter and what I call a sh short series, four weeks, um, on a living lesson on forgiveness. Today is week two, um, and so as, as our custom, I would like to read those four verses for you, Philemon, um, verses four through seven. I thank my God, Paul says, always when I remember you, Philemon, in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the, and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have delivered, derived excuse me, much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. We live in a culture that, it, that knows little of forgiveness. And to be honest, our society doesn't care much about forgiveness. I'm convinced that one of the major contributors, if not the major contributor, to the destruction of relationships in our culture is the absence of forgiveness. Our culture pushes us to be unforgiving. It celebrates and exalts the people who are not willing to forgive. And if you don't think that is true, I would suggest to you a couple movies. Any of the John Wick series. Or any of the Rambo movies. And you will see how our culture is enamored with revenge. And because of the sinful wickedness and the lack of any social restraint in our culture, we have a society that is filled with bitterness, vengefulness, anger, hatred, hostility toward one another. It can be seen in uh, the retaliatory uh, kind of crimes that have become so common today. We see lawsuits filed in our courts, people taking other people to court for every conceivable and inconceivable reason. I was kind of frightened um, a number of years back to think that there are more people in law school today than all other professional graduate schools combined. We are prolifer proliferating a almost endless number of attorneys, not that I have any problem with attorneys, Personally, as a group, that's a different story. I got a problem with them. But there are an endless number of lawyers ready to file lawsuits against other people for every big and small issue of life that seems to be unjust. Even counselors are telling us that it's not healthy to forgive. There's a popular writ book written back in 2002 by a lady named Susan Forward entitled Toxic Parents. Subtitle, Overcoming the Hurtful Legacy and Reclaiming Your Life. The thesis of the book emphasizes 
the prevailing attitude in our culture that is negative toward the characteristic of forgiveness. One of the chapters of the book actually is entitled, You Don't Have to Forgive. In other words, you're a victim of toxic parents who poisoned you, and until you put the blame on them where it belongs, you're never going to be healthy. Hmm. Now, for the Christian, the person who has received the forgiveness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, the failure to forgive is unthinkable. I don't care what the issue is, I don't care what the offense is, and I don't care how hard this is to hear. A failure to forgive is a blatant act of disobedience to God and against his revealed word. We're told by Jesus himself that if anybody offends this, offends we are to forgive, how many times? Seventy times seven. We are to faithfully forgive an endless number of times. And the reason that we are to forgive like that is because our Father in heaven forgives us that way and continues to forgive us. And we are to faithfully forgive others following in his footsteps. But if we buy into the culture, a culture that says you don't have to forgive, that you have the right to take revenge, you can sue anyone. You ought to blame someone else for what you are responsible for and make sure that they pay painfully for what they have done for you, to you. Now, if we buy into that mentality, what is the fruit of that kind of mindset, that unforgiving spirit? I think four things happen. I I put them on your outline. If you are a Christian, four things will happen to you. Number one, unforgiveness will imprison you in the past. If you fail to forgive an offender, an offense committed against you, You're chained to the past. Unforgiveness keeps that pain alive. It keeps that sore open and never lets the wound heal. If you go through this life reminding yourself of what was done to you, what you're actually doing is scratching that wound open again. You're digging at that sore. You're stirring up the pain. And every time you do that, your anger intensifies. What's the point of that? Are we so masochistic that we want to live our whole lives in pain? Unforgiveness just imprisons you to the past. It it, it, it causes you to regurgitate that unforgiving attitude and you, you accumulate the tragedy of anger and hostility. On the other hand, forgiveness opens the door and lets the prisoner free. It sets you free from the pain of your past. Now, I'm not suggesting some pixie dusk, miraculous, it's gone type thing. But the first step is for you to acknowledge the sin that they caused against you and to take it to the cross where Jesus already paid for it. And you let it go. That's forgiveness. That's when you can move forward into a glorious future that God has planned for you. But if you will not be willing to forgive, you're stuck in the past. And you can't move forward. Secondly, unforgiveness produces bitterness in your soul. 
Bitterness is an infection. It is the poison that you yourself drink, hoping it will cause harm to the other person. You will become caustic and sarcastic and condemning, and your, your disposition will become nastier. It will produce a distorted view of life where you literally have allowed yourself to become diseased. Anger begins to rage. And you can very easily end up out of control. Your bitterness will cause you to continually think of thoughts of revenge. And I hate to say it, but this happens most notably in your marriage. Two believers who marry should never divorce. Are there exceptions to that? Absolutely there are. And I don't have time to go into that, but they should not divorce. They should rarely, if ever, separate, and they should enjoy a happy relationship throughout all life. That is God's design. But the problem is, and I know this from experience, that when I got married, I married a sinner. And so did she. And the truth is, it is utterly impossible for the two of us not to offend each other. And it just doesn't happen every now and then. It happens all the time. But, as a couple, when you choose to operate from the position of continual forgiveness, when any type of offense rears its ugly head, when you immediately forgive, the hurt is gone. Forgiveness erases bitterness, replaces it with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Why would I want to be chained to the past? Why would I live with bitterness that makes me destroy every relationship? Thirdly, unforgiveness gives Satan an open door. It pulls out the welcome mat and invites demons in. And if you think that's overstated, you need to be reminded of Ephesians 4, 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. If you go to bed at night angry with your spouse, brooding over the hurt, not willing to forgive, you're giving Satan a foothold in your marriage. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul gives a very direct statement about this issue. Paul says, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, he can't even remember. Has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that, purpose clause, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. The devil moves in on an unforgiving heart and life, and it is not an exaggeration to say that most of the ground that Satan gains in our lives, especially in our marriage, is because of unforgiveness. He should know better. I've lived with him for 42 years. He should know better by now. If Heidi has that attitude, our relationship is in trouble. Thankfully, I'm, I'm married to a woman who practices this every single day. Why would I want to be a prisoner of the past? Why would I want to live with the disease of bitterness infecting my life? Why would I want to throw the door open to the enemy of my soul? Fourthly, unforgiveness hinders your fellowship with God. 
as we saw last week, Jesus said to his disciples that if they forgave others that had sinned against them, God the Father would also forgive them. Now, thankfully, we live in the era of grace. And the forgiveness that was purchased at Calvary is already ours, Ephesians 4.21. Okay? Let's not misunderstand that. Don't try to apply something Jesus said to his disciples before the cross to us. Okay? The Lord's Prayer to us. We're only going to be forgiven if we forgive others. That's not what's happening today. But we do have a responsibility because of the forgiveness that we have received to forgive others. And when we do that, our Heavenly Father is pleased. Those are my children. They're living by my design. How foolish is unforgiveness? It makes me a prisoner of my past. It infects me with the disease of bitterness. It opens the door for demonic influence. It alienates me from rich fellowship with God. And how good is forgiveness? I enjoy fellowship with God. I protect myself from satanic involvement. I, I keep the pollution of bitterness out of my life, and I choose not to be a victim of my past. Forgiveness, because of the significance and importance, is dealt in great detail in Scripture. Matter of fact, there are over 75 word pictures about forgiveness in the Bible. And they're there to help us grasp the importance of the character, the nature, and the effect of forgiveness. Let me just give you a few. The forgiveness is a key that opens the cell door and lets the prisoner free. Forgiveness is to write in large letters across a debt nothing owed. To forgive is to pound the gavel in a courtroom and say, not guilty. To forgive is to shoot an arrow so high and far that it can never be found. To forgive is to bundle up all the garbage and dispose of it, leaving the house clean and fresh. To forgive is to loosen the moorings of the ship and release it to the open sea. To forgive is to grant full pardon to the condemned criminal. To forgive is to relax a stranglehold on a wrestling opponent and to give him life. To forgive is to sandblast the wall of graffiti, leaving it brand new. And to forgive is to smash the clay pot into a thousand pieces so that, so that it can never be put together again. Forgiveness. It is so important that it is at the core of our spiritual health. It is so essential that the Holy Spirit devoted this entire letter to the one subject of forgiveness. Quick review. Philemon is a man who lives in the city of Colossae. Uh, he is married to a lady named Aphia. They have a son named Archippus, who is the pastor of the church that meets in his house. Philemon is a wealthy man because in that culture and in that time, only people of means could afford their own house. And the church is in the city of Colossae. He had a slave named Onesimus. And even though Philemon was a, a good master, Onesimus wanted his freedom. And so one day he runs away. Not only does he run away, but he steals from his master and 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 in doing so, commits a felony, which at least inclu would include imprisonment, but possibly death. Onesimus ran from the small town of Colossae to the largest town in the Roman Empire, Rome itself, where over a million people lived, half of them slaves. He thought he'd hide in the underground and become another uh, faceless runaway who lived in the back alleys of the city. But it wasn't long under God's providence that that slave came face to face with a very formidable man that he had heard of named Paul of Tarsus. Paul confronts the runaway slave and he had the privilege of leading that slave to faith in Jesus Christ. Onesimus becomes a Christian. Paul finds 
finds out Onesimus belongs to his friend Philemon, and then he is a runaway. And even though Onesimus is now a believer and is a help to Paul, Paul knows he must send him back to his master. As a result, he sends Onesimus with Tychicus with the letters that we call uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, along with this one little letter to Philemon directly. And in that letter, Paul tells Philemon, I want you to forgive the runaway slave. Society says, don't forgive him. Society says, press charges against him and imprison him. Society says, make him pay back every dime that he stole. Society says, put a brand on his forehead of F because he's a fugitive. So everyone knows not to trust him. Paul says, forgive him. No matter how much it costs you, forgive him. That's the plea of this letter. And as the letter unfolds, it becomes apparent that Paul is asking Philemon to give forgiveness to a man who is repentant. Paul's done his part. Onesimus is coming back and asking for forgiveness. God has done the right work in his heart. Now it's Philemon's turn. Last week we looked at verses 1 through 3, which was an introduction to the letter, and we saw the importance of this story. Today we want to look at verses 4 through 7, the second part that deals with the spiritual character of one who forgives. Next week we'll look at verses 8 through 18, and that gives us the spiritual action of one who forgives, and Uh, Two weeks from now, verses 19 through 25, the spiritual motivation of one who forgives. As we read these verses, my hope is that you don't just see principles for forgiveness that are implied in Paul's command to Philemon. But I hope you see that Paul is describing the characteristics of the person who forgives. Philemon, I know you are the kind of man that I can trust to forgive Onesimus. And so Paul sets him up by reminding him, of Philemon, of his own character and how wise to praise whenever possible. I don't put a whole lot of stock in psychology, but psychologists tell us for every correction, a child needs to hear 20 affirmations. When I was growing up, I heard 20 corrections for every one affirmation. And is it any wonder that as a young boy, I was struggling with confidence? I struggled with inferiority. Paul initiates the letter by affirming Philemon. If someone says to you, I want to tell you, I look at your life and I just thank God you are such a godly Christian. What does that do to you? Make you feel bad for your sin? Or does it motivate you to follow Christ even more closely. Believe me, sincere praise is the spiritual food that nurtures virtue. Notice what he says in verse 4. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. He says, in effect, every time I pray for him, Onesimus, And I pray for you, Philemon. It's always with thanksgiving. I'm always praying for you. And I thank my God. He he Paul didn't have anything else to say to the than other than other than thank you. Because I continue to hear, literally. The word keeps coming to me about what makes me pray for you, and I always pray saying, Lord, thank you for him. 
Thank you. And the news about Philemon was continually good. There's nothing in this letter of correction, as there is in most of Paul's other letters. There is nothing uh, suggests suggest that there are errors in his theology or something that wasn't right in his home or that something wasn't right in his marriage. Everything was as it should be in this man's life. Everything Paul knew about Philemon just made him thank God. And what did he hear? What did he know about him? Number one, that he had a concern about the Lord. Note the first thing he says in verse 5. Paul says, because I hear of your love and the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus. That's the first thing I want us to notice. Paul heard that he had a true faith in the Lord Jesus. He had a concern for the Lord. I, I know I can come to see you, Philemon. I know that I can ask you to forgive because you are concerned about the Lord. You have a true saving faith. You are a genuine believer. And therefore, you have the ability to forgive. And, and I know you know how much you've been forgiven. So you can now forgive. He had that impulse of the new life in Christ. The prompting of the Holy Spirit to the experience of conviction by the Word of God. He was a believer that desired to do what was right and what honored the Lord. And so Paul appeals to him to forgive because he knew that Philemon's main concern was his relationship with the Lord Jesus. The verb here, here in verse 5 is in the tense that says, I continue to hear. It's not a one-time thing. I hear testimony after testimony after testimony about your love for and faith in the Lord Jesus and how it changes, it's changed your life and how it, your life is guided. It's just not orthodoxy, but it's orthopraxy. It's right belief, but it's also right practice. Philemon, you walk by faith in the Lord Jesus. You exhibit trust in, the, in him in everything. You seek his will. So I know, I, I know that what I'm going to ask you to do, you, you'll do. So the first characteristic of a forgiver is one who is genuinely concerned about honoring the Lord. The contrast to that, we see back in Romans chapter 3, Verse 10, where Paul gives the basic description of the nature, the character, and the disposition of the unbeliever. There is none righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one desires good, not even one. In Romans 3, the first thing he says about the unbeliever is that they're not good. They're wicked. They're sinful. They can't do anything completely good. Even their good is bad good. <laughs> because what they do, humanly, which is humanly good, is usually motivated by pride and what they're going to get out of it. Not God's glory. So even the good they do is bad good. But then most of them do bad bad. He goes on to say their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And you would think that he's writing Romans 3 about our culture. About 2024. Last weekend, 21 people were killed in Chicago. 21 people in one weekend. And that's not even the worst weekend. That's just last weekend. Swift to shed blood.
people open their mouths and out comes the filth. Out comes the rottenness. Out comes the depravity. There's no forgiveness, only bitterness, revenge, anger, hate, hostility. Why? Because they're not reconciled to God. They have not been forgiven, and so as a result, they have the capacity to forgive. They're not prepared to forgive. Philemon, I know you are prepared to forgive. Secondly, he had a concern for other people, verse 5. Because I hear of your love for all the saints. That's the second characteristic. Philemon had a love for fellow believers, the body of Christ. The word here, love, is not the word philos, the original word which means friendship. It's not storge, it is not eros, it is agape. The love of choice, the love of the will, the love of self-sacrifice, the love of humility. The love that says, I don't care about myself, I care about you. That's the love that says, I will meet you and I will make any sacrifice to meet your need. That's the love we are have to have for one another. And it is compelled to serve because, Romans 5, God's love is what is gushing out from our heart. It's not our love, it's his love through us. That's what Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, 6, faith working through love. What he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, I don't have to teach you how to love. You've been taught to love by God. 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not, whoever does not love abide, abide in love is death. If you're saved, you love the brothers. If you don't, you're not saved. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the capacity to love. You have the love of God gushed out in your hearts. You have the capacity. It's there. Now, do you exercise it? No, that's a step of faith. Paul says to Philemon, I know you can forgive. Why? Because faith was real. He had a concern for the Lord. He had a concern for people. He expressed agape with other people. It wasn't self-serving. Thirdly, he had a concern for the fellowship. Look at verse 5 again. I hear of your love, <clears throat> excuse me, and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Paul adds another characteristic to the forgiving person, saying that the true saving faith they will have desire to share their faith and, 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 and envelop people in the fellowship of the believers. Faith pursues fellowship. There's no such thing as the Lone Ranger Christian. Out on the... What's the word I'm looking for? Prairie. 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 Who said that? Blossom. My, my thesaurus over here. Out on the prairie all by himself, needing no one and nothing. And even Tonto has to chase him all the time to keep up with him. Because Lone Ranger doesn't need him. Tonto understands the necessity of two, not just one. Faith pursues fellowship. The word fellowship comes from the original word koinonia. You've probably heard that before if you've been in church circles at all. It's often translated fellowship, but it means more than that. It actually means belonging. That's the best word. As a believer, you belong to someone else. And someone else belongs to you because... We are members of one another. And so Paul says to Philemon, I know your faith and your concern and how important that is to you, but what's also important, I, I know you know this, is the mutual belonging we have with one another.
What's his implication here for Philemon? Onesimus is coming back. Onesimus is now a brother in Christ. And that means that he is in the fellowship. And Philemon, he belongs to you. Not just as a slave, but also as a brother in Christ. Philemon belongs to Onesimus, not only as a master, but also as a brother. And Paul is saying, not only to Philemon, but to us as well, you must forgive because they're part of the family. Wow. When someone wrongs you outside of the family versus someone who wrongs you inside the family, which one's easier to forgive? That's a rhetorical question. Don't answer. (laughs) Think about it. My experience is harder to forgive the family member. And yet the family member should be the one you forgive most readily. You want, you want to forgive everyone because you don't want bitterness. You don't want anything coming between you and the other person. You want to model Jesus, you know. But a family member? I was raised by a man who all he had growing up was his family. My father's father left the family when he was two and my uncle was six months. 1924. My grandmother raised her two sons by herself through the Depression. In one room the size of this stage, I saw the room. That's where they lived in a one-room apartment in the attic of a house for free from someone from the church they attended. They all three worked and hopefully pooled their money in order to eat. My father raised us with the ethic, family comes first. Because he knew survival was absolutely, the only way you could survive was the family pulling together. Not my uncle spending the money he made on something for himself. Not my dad spending the money on something that he wanted, or my grandmother doing the same thing, but all three of them pooling their money so they could buy sufficient groceries just to eat. And so there came a time when I was uh, my father, a friend of my dad's, who was the public address announcer at the Seattle Supersonics basketball games, gave my dad two, three courtside seats to one of the Sonic games against the Washington Bullets. This was back in 1977 when the Sonics were really good. My brother Brent and I, yeah, we're going to go, and I'm going to take my girlfriend with me. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, My dad says, no, you're going to take your little brother, Kent. He's 11, Dad. Brent and I are in high school. Come on. You want to go to the game? Yeah. You take your brother. So I tell my girlfriend she can't go, and I I I have to take my brother. Why? Family comes first. You want to secure your marriage? Boy, this is way off topic. I mean, it's on topic, but it's way out of my, off my notes. You want to secure your marriage? You want, to, you want to glue that sucker together? Sucker. No, it's not. <laughs> Cheapers. Practice forgiveness in everything. My sweet wife, she is a phenomenal cook. I thought my mom was a good cook. No disrespect, mom. You're a terrible cook compared to my wife, okay? Uh, 
she's not here. She doesn't hear that. She's, she's in heaven enjoying the meal with Jesus, so relax. But my, and my, when my wife cooks, she never puts anything back in the cupboard. Everything is everywhere. I'm a man of everything in its place, and its, its place, everything has its place, and everything should be in its place, right? Or something like that. And, 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 and she, she can't figure out that dirty dishes don't go in the sink, they go in the dishwasher. You rinse them and put them in the dishwasher. She's in her 60s. She hasn't figured that out yet. So what is Scotty re responsible to do? Take him from the sink and put him in the dishwasher to serve her. And I forgive. Now, that's a dumb thing, right? I forgive her inability to comprehend that this is where the things get washed. Okay? And, and that's a dumb thing because that's about the worst thing she does. Okay? Uh, if she were up here, she could tell some, uh, uh, no, okay, we don't, won't, won't let her up here. Um, but if you want to secure, you want to cement your marriage, you practice this. I have an expectation. I crucify that expectation. And if I really want that done, I'm willing to serve and do that. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. How many of you are willing to serve? To crucify self in order to serve your spouse? My wife's love language is quality time and touch, non-sexual touch. Those aren't mine. If I don't spend time with my wife, if I don't just have eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball connection with my wife, my wife's love tank drains really fast. I have to carve out time. I, there's one thing I don't have is time. I have so many responses, but I have to craft... Because who's my, next to the Lord Jesus, who's my number one priority in this world? Heidi Myers. And I've got to practice that reality by sacrificing other things I would rather do or need to do for her because she's the priority. That was 10 minutes and it wasn't even on my notes. So, okay. Concern for the fellowship. Concern for one another. Concern for those I'm a member of. Lastly, he has a concern for knowledge. I'll go quick. Verse 6, I pray that in the sharing of your faith you may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. This is the word epignosis, experiential knowledge. I pray that you will experience the outworking of walking by faith with Christ so that in the sharing of your faith, people see a difference. And what is the most effective means that you can share Christ? It's not your words. It's your life. It's how you treat your spouse. It's how you sacrifice for your children and grandchildren. It's how you, you see what needs to be done and you lighten the load of your spouse. Or at work, you see what needs to be done and someone else is struggling and you step in and help. Without recognition, without the need for being paid back for any of it. I don't loan people money. I don't. Because I don't want the, the issue of trying to get them to pay me back. If I've got it, it's yours. I give. I, I don't, it's not even a second thought. You know why? Because it's not mine anyway. It's his. And I'm to steward it well, and so I just give it away. He gave it to me. I'm going to give it away. Who's responsible for me for my future? He is, not me. Well, I am to a degree. I need to be a good steward. I need to be faithful, yes. But I am to serve knowledge, epignosis. Philemon, if you forgive Onesimus, you're going to immediately experience the good thing that you called, that you were called to, and that is forgiveness. 
You can read about it in a book, you can, but you, you really won't know it until you have to do it. There's a difference between seeing pictures of skiing the Swiss Alps and skiing the Swiss Alps. There's a difference between us talking about forgiveness and you walking it out. First of all, with your family, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, then your extended family. We all have a crazy Uncle Harry. We all do. Love him. Yeah, he's weird. Okay. Okay, we're all weird in our own way. The person that forgives has a deep knowledge of forgiveness because they do it. And so the person that forgives becomes a blessing to those around. Number five, verse seven, for I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. The man had a reputation for love. He had a reputation of great joy and encouragement. See the word, the hearts, goes to back to the very beginning when we talked about pathos, life. It's the word splankna. It meant bowels. The, the Greek mind thought that emotions stirred from your gut. And that's the word he uses here, the seat of the emotions. That's the kind of people that forgive. That's exactly what Paul says be, that he became, verse 8, which we'll, we'll deal with next week. Anybody who loves the Lord Jesus, anybody who loves fellow believers, anybody who loves the fellowship, anybody who loves true knowledge, anybody who, everybody who wants to be a blessing is going to be a forgiver. Period. End of story. That is the character of the kind of person who willingly forgives. Paul establishes this spiritual character of someone who's willing to forgive by exposing us to the character of Philemon. And as a result, next week we will see what Paul asks him to do. I'm going to ask you to do it right now. Is there someone in your life that you need to forgive? Forgive them. Might be a parent, might be a coworker, a boss, might be a spouse. Let it go. And you will walk in the freedom that Christ wants for you. Let's pray. Thank you again for our time in the Word. Thank you, Lord, that you lay out the spiritual characteristics of someone like Jesus, someone who forgives. From the heart. May we be that kind of people. Thank you for modeling it for us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for empowering it in our lives. Thank you for the clear, clear, clarion call to forgive because God in Christ forgave us. May we feel the weight of the command of grace to show grace and forgive those who have injured us. And may that testimony go far and wide that this family of believers that cares about the fellowship willingly forgives not only one another, but those people in their lives that have hurt them. And may you empower us to walk in the freedom you desire. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. All God's people said, Amen.